All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Sean here at Zycel. Um, thank you for joining us for today's presentation. As we go through today, if you have any questions, use the question and answer part of the Zoom interface um, to send those in. And depending on the question and when I see it, um, I may answer it live or I may wait until the end of the presentation. Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. Today, we are talking about our new Wi-Fi 7 access points. We've got two different access points we'll be talking about today. Uh, but to start with, we'll start just talking about Wi-Fi several, excuse me, Wi-Fi 7 in general, um, and what makes it different and unique from the previous versions of Wi-Fi that have been out there. So Wi-Fi 7 builds on top of Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Um, you might have noticed there was a very short um, sort of overlap there or a gap between the two, unlike the previous versions of Wi-Fi where there have been a lot longer gaps between them. And that's why. It's because basically Wi-Fi 6 was sort of a transitional technology. Um, it was the first major rewrite of how Wi-Fi acts. Um, designed to solve a lot of the issues that have been plaguing Wi-Fi for a long time. So Wi-Fi 7 is built on top of that, basically taking what worked there and extending it out further. Um, some of the main benefits of Wi-Fi 7 is up to five times faster speeds than Wi-Fi 6. In theory, you can have devices providing up to 46 gigabits per second of throughput speed. We've got double the bandwidth. Wi-Fi 6 allowed you to use channels up to 160 megahertz. Wi-Fi 7 lets you use 320 megahertz channels. We've increased the encoding from a 1,024-bit QAM to 4,096-bit QAM, which gives you about a 20% data increase. And then we've introduced a technology called MLO, which I'll talk about later, but that allows faster speeds or allowing you to uh, reduce your latency over your wireless network. So this is sort of showing you the history here of Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. Um, as you can see, it's been a really condensed timeline with some overlap there. So Wi-Fi 7 itself is not officially been released by IEEE. It's 99% of the way there, but the final vote, I believe, is... Uh, it says on this slide here, Q2, but I think it's actually been pushed back slightly since then. So everything that's out there now is based on the Wi-Fi 7 draft, pretty much one of the later versions of the Wi-Fi 7 draft. So we don't expect there to be much differences between what's available today and what's available once it gets ratified. And there's a very good chance that if there are any changes, those can be added using firmware updates. Now, there will be what's called Release 2. So that's going to add some additional features. And so similar to how 802.11 AC had wave one and wave two, we will have release one and release two of Wi-Fi 7. The main benefit here with release two is AP coordination, um, allowing access points to talk to each other to coordinate how they're using the airtime. So just to show you here, to give you an idea here of the increased spectrum we have access to now that 6 gigahertz has been open to us. So 6 gigahertz was first made available, what, about 18 months ago um, using Wi-Fi 6E products. So it's the same thing going on with Wi-Fi 7 as far as spectrum. So historically, we've had 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz to play with when it comes to Wi-Fi. So with Wi-Fi 6 now opened up and available to use, you can see here that Wi-Fi 6 actually has more spectrum available than 2.4 and 5 gigahertz combined. So that extra spectrum means you get to have um, faster speeds. You can use wider channels. Um, it means less interference. And um, it means easier deployments for you. So you don't have to spend as much time doing site surveys and you know channel selection because there's so much channels and bandwidth that's available for you. So for instance, we're talking about 160 megahertz channels. You know, those were the as fast as you could go. But when it came to um, Wi-Fi 6, there was only two of those that are available in the five gigahertz space, and they both overlap with DFS. And if you've been through my Wi-Fi 101, you know that a lot of clients don't support DFS, making 160 megahertz off uh, unavailable um, for a lot of clients. And because there's only 60 megahertz available in 2.4 in the U.S., Obviously, you can't use 160 megahertz channels. So with six gigahertz here, we have we have seven non-overlapping 160 megahertz channels or three 
320 megahertz channels that you can use before you have to worry about overlapping with additional access points and interference issues. Now, one of the cool technologies here, what I mentioned earlier, was multi-link operation. So up until Wi-Fi 7, we had what we now call single link operation, or we used to just call, you know, standard Wi-Fi. Um, and single link operation basically means your client device, when it connects to the access point, would choose to either connect to the 2.4 gigahertz radio or the 5 gigahertz radio, but not both at the same time. Multi-link operation, on the other hand, allows client devices to simultaneously connect to multiple radios in the access point. So instead of having one connection from the client to your access point, in theory, you could have up to three uh, connections from the client to the access point. Um, so you could have your client connecting on 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz simultaneously. Now, what you can do when you do this, now you've got three connections or two connections, depending on your client device and what the hardware supports, um, is you can increase your bandwidth, right? You can break up the data that you're wanting to send into three separate streams and then combine them together um, for one, you know, super fast stream. Or alternately, you can use it as a way to reduce latency. So this is going to be a key technology, I think, for those of you doing voice over Wi-Fi. Because that's always been one of the problems and hassles with voice over Wi-Fi is even though it is very low bandwidth intensive, it's it's very sensitive to drop packets and packet retransmissions, lowering the quality of that voice signal. So what happens here with Wi-Fi 7 is you send the same data over multiple streams. So that way, if the packets get dropped for whatever reason due to interference or other issues on one of those streams, the other stream continues to carry that same data and get through and then get recombined together so it appears as a single stream, thus lowering latency because you're dropping the number of packets that need to be trans retransmitted, solving jitter issues. Um, so it's a really interesting technology there. There's also another technology here called multi-RU puncturing. And this is something that's going to help you out when it comes to interference caused by devices outside your control. So a lot of our Wi-Fi devices out there, um, you know, we overlap channels with, you know, maybe your neighbor's access points, other businesses' access points, but all sorts of other wireless technologies that are currently using 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, Bluetooth, um, a lot of proprietary protocols on smart plugs and things like that. So what this allows you to do is use a wide channel. In this case, we could say up to a 320 megahertz channel. And then if there's a neighboring product that overlaps with it, that's using 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz or whatever, we can basically split our existing channel and create a hole in it. So it no longer overlaps with that interfering signal. So instead of getting drop packets, we reduce the bandwidth that we're using uh, and can straddle that interference, reducing the overall interference and hit that we're going to have um, on our client devices. So those are some of the technologies that go into Wi-Fi 7. So now I'll start talking about the products. So the first product I want to talk about here is the NWA-130BE. So this is a tri-radio Wi-Fi 7 access point. So it operates on 2.4, 5 gigahertz, and 6 gigahertz. And this guy has a street price of $179. So you're getting a tri-radio Wi-Fi 7 access point, lifetime warranty, speeds up to BE 11,000 or 11 gigabits. Now, obviously, you're not going to get 11 gigabits. It's Wi-Fi. There's all that overhead that goes into it. So, you know, you're going to get less than that. But, you know, it's, that's the class. That's how it's officially classed. Um, and it's got multi-gig Ethernet ports on it for $179. So it's a heck of a deal. It is powered by 802.3 ATPOE, so you don't need the special BT PoE products. Any switch that provides 802.3 AT or 30 watt PoE is able to power this up. There is both a 2.5 gigabit input port and an output port, so you can daisy chain your connection with an existing connection to add the access point to a room. And the reason it's now a rectangle is that we have found that with these tri-radio access points, the best way to reduce interference between the different radios is to space them out in a rectangular pattern. So you'll see all of our future um, tri-radio access points moving now towards this rectangular housing. 
And just like all of our other business class access points, it uses this um, multi-function mounting bracket. So this mounting bracket itself has been designed to basically fit on a wall outlet or a round or rectangular junction box. So we've got a lot of different screw holes there based on those different standardized outlets there. Um, it also works with our T-bar clip. So if you need to mount this on T-bar, you can buy our optional T-bar clips. We sell them in packs of five. Um, basically those clip onto the T-bar, the bracket screws into those, and then the access point slides onto that and snaps in place, holding it there securely. So some of the features found in this and in our other Wi-Fi 7 access point are our RF first by design, basically putting a lot of effort into the design of the hardware to help reduce interference. As I mentioned earlier, we have the rectangular housing to provide proper spacing between the different radios to avoid interference between some of the nearby channels. Um, we also build into our access point something that's missing on a lot of our competitors' products, which is a 4G slash 5G filter. Now you're saying, well, why, why do I need a 4G, 5G filter? Um, basically, some of those channels that 4G and 5G use here in North America border the free-to-use Wi-Fi channels that we have access to, and there is often spillover from those. Now, you're not generally going to find an issue with this, like in a home where the, where the uh, cellular signal is coming in from a tower down the road. This is primarily for those of you that are deploying inside large office buildings, conference centers, things like that where they use a DAS system to broadcast cellular inside the building itself, because these cellular signals often can't penetrate very far into buildings. So for larger buildings, like I said, large office buildings, even some bigger hotels and apartment complexes, they use a DAS system, which distributes what look like access points around the building, but instead of broadcasting Wi-Fi, they broadcast cellular. And in those environments, those cellular signals can sometimes interfere with your Wi-Fi. So by our design here, we have solved that. This guy here supports advanced security. So of course we have our WPA3 enterprise security is supported. We also offer our optional license to add CNP, connect and protect plus service to the access point. So that allows your access point to provide UTM like services on specified SSIDs. It also allows you to do bandwidth throttling on a per application basis. And the support DPPSK, dynamic pre-shared key, basically allowing you to use one SSID. And then when users log in, they each have their own unique password. And when they connect with that password, we automatically assign them a VLAN based on a database in the back end. So that way your sales guys, when they connect, they get put on the sales guys VLAN. Your you know, ops guys get put on the ops guys VLAN, et cetera. Your guests go on to the guest VLAN. And one of the nice things about this is when a, when a uh, user leaves, you simply turn off their password since their password is unique to the individual user. Oh, and I thought I had fixed this. Okay, I, I still have not fixed my uh, my animation fully here. Let me see if I can go back and get it to work. One more. No, it's not going to work. There we go. So this is our new high-end flagship access point. This is the WBE660S. This is also a tri-radio Wi-Fi 7 access point. And this guy here supports speeds up to BE22000. So yes, 22 gigabits per second Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, um, including all overhead that goes into it. This is a Nebula Flex Pro product. So this can be managed by our controllers that are built in on USG Flex series. Um, this also includes one year of Nebula Pro bundled with it. It has our unique smart antenna technology built in on it. There we go. And as I was talking about before, it's got our RF first technology providing extra shielding inside. Uh, providing better performance. It's got that rectangular housing design. Our antennas are not mounted directly onto the PCBA. They are on their own board. This has Bluetooth BLE built in on it for those of you doing those sort of smart applications out in the field. It has a large heat spreader both above the board and the bottom of the housing is also a, uh, a heat dissipator there. And the uplink to this is a 10 gig uplink port. 
Now, in order to power this guy up, you do need 802.3 BT PoE, otherwise known as PoE++. So that's the PoE that provides up to 60 watts of power per port. We've got a number of different switches that can provide it. Alternately, if you want to use AC power, we use a USB-C port, and it will work with any sort of USB Type-C charger that offers 45 watts or greater power delivery. So if you're looking at, a, you can just buy those anywhere on Amazon or wherever you happen to shop for USB adapters. As long as they are PD for, and 45 watts or more, they will work to power this guy up. As you can see on this one here, the back of the housing is not a normal plastic. So normally in most of our access points, we have a plastic housing with vent holes. And then inside we've got a large um, heat shield that's designed to pull heat off of the board and vent it out those holes. So on this model here, instead of doing that, the whole back of the housing becomes a heat sink. As you can see, we've got those fins there that provide not only heat dissipation by increasing surface area, they also help work to reduce RF uh, interference noise, and then they vent the heat out that way. And in addition to the 10 gig uplink port here, we do have the one gig pass-through port for those of you looking to do daisy chaining. The mounting bracket for this is very similar to our other standard uh, mounting brackets, but obviously it's had to be modified a little bit um, due to the unusual shape of the back of the access point. But it's the same thing. It's got the screw holes provided in it to allow you to mount this to any sort of standard rectangular outlet box, rectangular junction box, or a round junction box. And it too can also work with our uh, T-bar clips if you want to mount it up on a uh, T-bar. So all of these access points work with Nebula. So for those of you that haven't sat through one of my hundreds of Nebula presentations, Nebula is our free cloud management platform that allows you to manage your devices and your customers in the cloud for free. So for those of you that aren't familiar with our smart antenna technology, I want to talk about it here briefly. So smart antenna, it's a generic term. For whatever reason, we decided not to create our own in-house term for it. So our smart antenna is very similar to, say, the Ruckus Beamflex Plus. So those of you familiar with Ruckus's Beamflex Plus, this is a similar technology. And basically, the ideas behind it are to increase capacity. So more users on the same access point, reduce interference, and that helps with density as far as APs go. So if you have an environment where you need to put a lot of APs in a small area, this helps with that as well as in areas where you've got interference coming in from your neighbors and things like that. Increasing the coverage area and reducing power utilization. So the way a traditional access point works is it has a fixed antenna pattern that's been optimized for you mounting this on a ceiling, covering the area below it. So the signal radiates out in sort of an umbrella shaped pattern from the access point. And it doesn't do anything. It stays and maintains that same coverage pattern no matter what. So with smart antenna technology, instead of having a single antenna in there or a single set of antennas, we have an array of antennas that allows us to basically in real time switch between hundreds of different antenna patterns, allowing us to choose the antenna pattern that's optimized based not only on where the client is in relationship to the access point, but our algorithm that we use also takes into account other sources of RF interference and overlap on the channel we're using and helps choose an antenna pattern that allows us to ignore that interference. And so because of that, we have the ability in uh, dense environments with multiple APs to actually be able to achieve greater than 100% airtime utilization. So it creates a, it works great in dense environments where there's a lot of interference or dense environments where there's lots of users. It doesn't require anything special on the client device in order for it to work. And it does work with mobile clients. They do not have to be stationary like with beamforming. So that's sort of the basics as far as these new access points go. Um, so this guy right now, um, official street price on this is $699, but it is priced for you guys, so you can offer it at $499 and still maintain your normal margin. We are running promos on places like Amazon or our web store at $499, so we've provided the wholesale price through distribution based on $499, although the price sheet will say $699 for this guy, which makes it, for this performance, I believe the cheapest Wi-Fi 7 access point offering this level of performance that's out there right now. 
and it does qualify for the partner discount. So you still get your eight, 16 or 20% discount on top of the normal margin markup that uh, distribution provides you. So some of the applications where you might want to use Wi-Fi 7, high density locations. So again, anywhere where you've got a lot of users or you've got a lot of access points in the same general area, um, Wi-Fi 7 is great because of that six gigahertz radio. So it helps you solve some of your, uh, you know, solve those overlap issues by giving you a lot more channels to distribute across your access points. It gives you the tri radio so you can distribute your client devices across all three radios. And if you're using our WBE 660S, you also get the smart antenna, which helps with that as well. Another area where we see Wi-Fi 7 having a big play is when it comes to mesh networking for business. Now, mesh networking has, you know, taken over the home market. Um, you know, even ISPs now are often giving out mesh-based routers and satellites to provide coverage in a house. And people have tried to do mesh in business. You know, we've offered it for years and years and years, but it's never really taken off in part because you end up having to share limited five gigahertz spectrum for both your clients and your bridges. Um, you know, both APs have to be using the same channel and all clients on both APs have to be using the same channel. And if you add more and more APs into that mesh, you know, it hurts performance and it just, the performance hasn't been there as far as an enterprise or business application. So that kind of changes now with Wi-Fi 7, because now we've got these tri-radio access points. Most of your clients are going to be using 2.4 and 5 gigahertz for the next few years until Wi-Fi 7 gets greater mass adoption. So you can use that 6 gigahertz radio to create a super high speed, super reliable mesh between your access points that doesn't overlap with your 2.4 and 5 gigahertz users, solving those bandwidth issues and solving a lot of the latency issues that you normally find in a mesh application. So we, we tend to think here that Wi-Fi 7 is going to be ideal for being able to deploy access points in an area where you don't want to provide or can't provide Ethernet backhaul to them and still provide a very high-speed, reliable network. And the other area where Wi-Fi 7 really shines is high bandwidth applications. So for those of you that don't know, you know, a uh, high def video on, uh, how should I put this, um, uncompressed requires in the neighborhood of four to five gigabits per second data rate. So that's something that hasn't been capable in the past. So in order to do HD video streaming, we've had to do a lot of compression. So obviously when you're compressing your video stream, you're losing some of that the video quality there, but it also adds a latency. So I know a lot of people, for instance, like to prefer to use wireless for like their VR headsets and do wireless streaming from their PC to the headset so they're not tripping over cables and things like that. But it's always been adding some extra latency, even when the you know they're both connected to the same access point because of the need to compress and decompress the video. So that's one area here where Wi-Fi 7 shines. Um, you're going to be able to provide, you know, wireless to wireless users somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 gigabits or better throughput, um, allowing you to be able to send uncompressed video, solving those latency issues or solving those quality issues that you may have. And I'm sure as more people get used to the amount of bandwidth that's available, more applications will come online that can take advantage of this extra bandwidth that 6 gigahertz and Wi-Fi 7 can provide. And with that, guys, that is the end of today's official presentation. Um, I do want to highlight a few things here for you. So to begin with, most of our webinars are recorded and then uploaded to our YouTube channel. There are multiple Zycel YouTube channels, basically one for each reason. So the one for North America is called Zycel America channel. So you'll find our recorded webinars there. You will find... Um, product introductions, best practices videos, video case studies, et cetera. And again, if you have any questions, send them in using the question and answer interface. I don't have any now, so I do want to hit some things that people do ask about when it comes to Wi-Fi 7. So obviously one of them is, are there Wi-Fi 7 clients out there today? And the answer is yes, there's few of them. Um, so there are the uh, Google Pixel 8 series provides Wi-Fi 7. Samsung Galaxy 24 Ultra provides Wi-Fi 7. Um, the iPhone 15 does not provide Wi-Fi 7, but it does provide 6E on 6 gigahertz for you. 
in theory, the Samsung Galaxy 23 Ultra could be upgraded to Wi-Fi 7 via firmware update. But as far as I'm aware, they still haven't done that. And then we're starting to see Wi-Fi 7 trickle into laptops. You know, some of the challenges we're running into with Wi-Fi 7, obviously, it's a new chip. It's expensive. It's going to take time and generations to get the power utilization down. Um, another question we often get involves MLO, that multi-link operation. So all of our access points that are Wi-Fi 7 do support it. However, we have not enabled it yet. We're currently targeting July for when we'll enable it via free, free firmware update. And the reason we're doing that because is because as of now, there's only one device that supports it out in the market, um, which is that Galaxy S24 Ultra. So we're waiting for some more devices to hit the market um, because we are expecting there to be some interoperability issues with the different chipsets implementing it slightly differently. So we're waiting till a few more of those come out um, and we can make sure we fully interoperate with everything that's out there. So right now we're targeting July for that. And then another question we get all the time with Wi-Fi 7 and Wi-Fi 6E is the six gigahertz coverage. So as Wi-Fi or radio frequencies go up, range goes down. So just like five gigahertz has less range than your 2.4 radio in your devices, six gigahertz is going to be a lower range or lower coverage area than your five gigahertz. So if you're just replacing existing APs with Wi-Fi 7 APs, your six gigahertz coverage will probably have some holes in it um, compared to what you were experiencing with your old APs. So you'll either need to add a few additional APs um, to cover those holes, or you'll just have to live with the idea that in certain areas, the clients are going to have to drop down to five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz to connect um, if they're operating in those areas where they do have holes. Another question we get a lot about six gigahertz um, is can I use it outdoors? And the answer for that, the simple answer to that is no. So outdoor six gigahertz operation has historically been a licensed spectrum and there are still licensed users using six gigahertz out in the field. So in order to operate six gigahertz access points outside, they have to be specifically certified by the FCC for outdoor use. And they also have to work with a third poly, or excuse me, third party service that maintains a data play, database of all the licensed users, the channels they're using, and the physical area of the coverage. And your access point every 24 hours has to reach out to that third party service, identify where it is located, and then it will be provided an updated list of the nearby users, and it will be told which channels it's allowed to use and what power it's allowed to use on those channels. So because of that, this software or the uh, software that was needed was just FCC certified a month or so ago. So as of right now, we do not have any outdoor six gigahertz products. And most of the six gigahertz outdoor products we saw at the latest WISP show um, were not actually certified. In fact, only one of the products that was on the market at that time was actually certified for actual use outdoors. Um, so you'll probably see more outdoor six gigahertz stuff coming along, but just keep that in mind. You can't just take your indoor AP, put it in an outdoor enclosure and mount it outside like a lot of you do with older AP technologies. If you do, you will be running afoul of the FCC. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, at some point, I hope we'll be able to announce some Zycel outdoor six gigahertz products, but at least of right now, there's nothing that's been announced from us. So with that, guys, that ends today's webinar. I didn't have any questions come in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. If you do have a question that comes up, you can email me or you can reach out to your salesperson and they can get the answer for you. Thank you for joining us. And I hope to see you at one of our future webinars.